So let's review corporations too. <laughs> and we'll begin with shareholder litigation. We discussed in this section shareholder litigation and also shareholder selling in stock markets. So we'll begin with the litigation element. And shareholder litigation, we talked first about it procedurally, whether or not we would commence with a direct or a derivative litigation. We commence with a derivative litigation. There is a demand requirement. When is that requirement excused? And what is the interrelationship of the excuse of that requirement to a special litigation committee? And in addition, who can sue? Who is a valid plaintiff under, under law? So we'll, we'll cover those issues first, and then we'll talk about the substance of shareholder litigation uh, by, by virtue of the violation of director's duties. So a derivative suit is effectively when the shareholder uh, causes the corporation to sue itself. And this is in some ways unusual because shareholders are owners but not managers of a corporation. It's the directors that manage a corporation and it's the directors that decide who the corporation sues. But as you can imagine, directors, mm, they may not decide to sue themselves for a number of reasons, including a conflict of interest, as we'll talk about in the duty of loyalty. So we have this special procedure for shareholder derivative suits when the directors harm the corporation, the shareholders, the owners can step in. And there are some particular uh, procedural requirements with, with those suits. If the action is derivative, we have to comply with, at least in Delaware, Rule 23.1, which, by the way, mirrors Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 23.1. And this requires the stockholder to retain ownership of the shares throughout the pendency of the litigation which can be burdensome, requires the suing sharehold to make a demand on the board or show that demand is excused. And most of these cases settle. They don't usually proceed to a full trial. Any settlement will need to be approved by a court. A direct suit is a little bit more conventional. It's more of a run-of-a-mill suit. It's uh, generally a class action, so in that way it's complex, but it falls under a broader category of complex class actions. It's usually pretty easy to certify a class of shareholders as having suffered the same harm, given that, in fact, they are all members of that same shareholder class, and they will, be, um, uh, they will recover directly for these actions because, as a class, their rights as shareholders were harmed. It's not the rights of the corporation that were harmed, but the shareholders themselves. When do they make these suits? Well, they're almost always going to be uh, some violation of the Securities Act of 1933 or the Exchange Act of 1934, you know, false or misleading statements in violation. Could also be some type of violation of their rights to vote, like the directors changing the date of a meeting or otherwise interfering with shareholder rights as shareholders. And in, you know, pref uh, preferred stock ownership usually has certain rights that accord with it, like preemptive rights to purchase more shares as to not be diluted. So if a, if a company uh, or a shareholder, could be an individual, but it could be a firm, owns preferred stock, and that stock has certain rights to participate in a future round, and for whatever reason the board does not give them that participation opportunity, that is actually a direct harm to the shareholder. It might not hurt the corporation at all. The corporation might raise the money just fine from somewhere else, but that shareholder, they had a right via that contract, that shareholder pr uh, preferred stock purchase agreement uh, that was violated. And they could sue in a direct action, and they may sue in a class if uh, there are enough of them. Uh, there are some procedure requirements that do, uh, direct uh, lawsuits will also face, um, mainly about class certification. Again, it's a kind of run-of-the-mill lawsuit, so they, of course, have many procedural limitations or restrictions on them. But uh, uh, class certification is usually not a serious problem in stockholder litigation because they tend to be similarly situated. So we have a little bit of a lighter procedural requirement. Uh, when do we bring a derivative suit? What are we going to see that's going to give us uh, derivative suit facts? Well, a corporate loss. So a siphoning or a usurpation of a corporate opportunity by a director who took that opportunity for him or herself. A waste of corporate assets, effectively giving corporate money as a gift a interested transaction where a director might not have been able to uh, uh, operate within the duty of care because they had an interest on both sides. Or overall poor performance. I mean, anytime the stock price goes down, the shareholders 
often claim uh, a derivative harm for that. Direct suits, on the other hand, pertain to financial rights of the shareholders as shareholders, so not the corporation's profits, but the dividends to be received by the shareholders. Of uh, voting rights, you know, enforcing their rights to vote on governance matters. Um, I had mentioned a couple others, you know, informational rights, rights that they themselves uh, own uh, as shareholders. And the test for this, such as it is, is in Thule. And we call this the Thule two-step, which basically asks two fundamental questions. Who suffered the harm and who would benefit from the recovery? And uh, this test leads us to answer whether a suit should be filed in a direct or a derivative manner. Now, if it's filed in a derivative manner, as mentioned, there is a demand requirement. The board is normally supposed to control the corporation, and so a derivative action challenges the board's business judgment, ability to run the company. So we have to have this sort of uh, workaround uh, because sometimes demand would be futile since directors would not sue themselves. In a way, it's similar to the concept of the duty of loyalty where we have a conflict of interest transaction. So when is demand excused? Uh, we look to Aronson for the demand excuse test and Aronson says that the plaintiff can have demand excused if with particularized facts in the complaint. The plaintiff alleges that the directors uh, are uh, not disinterested uh, or independent and the transaction was not a product of valid business judgment. And so uh, we saw Aronson gave us some guidance on that. One way that boards might avoid the problem if some of them are being sued is to form a committee an independent committee that will decide whether or not the suit should proceed. A SLC or special litigation committee is precisely that, a committee formed by the board to investigate and make recommendations about whether or not to pursue a lawsuit. We see in some later cases that there are some distinctions between deference to the board versus deference to the SLC. In fact, the board gets quite a lot of deference. They get the business judgment rule. The SLC does not. The SLC needs to be like Caesar's wife above reproach. All right, what is the structural bias argument? How does that tie in to our discussion here? Pesky typos. Oh, not that one, okay. What is structural bias? Structural bias is the idea that there is no real such thing as independence among boards because they're all, you know, 67-year-old white guys that graduated from Dartmouth and play golf at the same country club outside of Greenwich, Connecticut. And they go to each other's weddings and they go to each other's, you know, uh, kids' birthday parties and stuff like that, go sailing together on their, their yachts they made with all of your shareholder investment. And um, as a result, we can't really see them as disinterested. They're not going to be willing to sue each other. And in fact, SLCs rarely advise for a lawsuit, so there may be some truth to it, but the structural bias argument, for the most part, has not held water in Delaware in terms of uh, eschewing a SLC committee decision not to sue. So if there is an SLC, uh, the SLC will determine whether or not uh, to conduct uh, the lawsuit, um, but if any of them, uh, any of the members, are not beyond reproach, well, the plaintiff can uh, inquire into their independence or level of interest and potentially uh, suggest that the methodology or procedure used by the SLC was inappropriate. And so they really have to be very scrupulous in having a composition of members who are not interested and, uh, uh, and are independent and going through a lot of paper and process. All right, we also have a test from Zapata v. Maldonado. Uh, in this case, a shareholder sued Zapata alleging breach of fiduciary duties because, uh, and saying the demand should be excused because the majority of directors benefited. Zapata created an SLC, which hired advisors. The SLC, as usual, recommended dismissal, uh, and Zapata uh, moved to dismiss. The Court of Chancellery actually uh, denied the motion to dismiss and came up with a two-part test to determine whether or not they would believe, agree with, an SLC's decision to dismiss a lawsuit. The first being the court should inquire in the independence and good faith of the Special Litigation Committee, including the basis for its conclusions, and the court should balance the substantive nature 
of the non-frivolous claims against the corporate burden. Again, showing that simply having an SLC does not mean directors win. There are some ways to challenge it, and the composition of those committees have to be beyond reproach. Uh, in a, in a follow-up case, Einhorn v. Kulea, uh, this was under a Wisconsin statute, uh, so this is not a Delaware case. Uh, a corporation uh, may create a special litigation committee comprised of independent directors, uh, but the question here is whether a member of the committee who has a relationship would be expected to be able to perform appropriately, effectively asking again the question of whether or not uh, structural bias would play into it. And again, the court will defer to the SLC, will not adopt the structural bias argument so long as the SLC is properly composed and operating. All right, who qualifies as plaintiff? I guess I'll stop fixing the typos. Now we're on two of them. You can imagine that slash is, in fact, a question mark. Or maybe it's a slash. Just think about it. Uh, who qualifies as a plaintiff? Uh, well, you know, there are really only two requirements, and they're not very hard to achieve. Adequacy effectively means that you're represented by counsel. And we have some cases of some, you know, old retiree with dementia hanging out in Florida with like 12 shares of stock. Fine, as long as he's got competent counsel. If you're representing yourself, that's a bigger issue. Uh, but basically, a plaintiff who has an attorney is going to be found adequate. Uh, standing uh, is uh, a little bit more interesting. You have to have an equity interest in the corporation. So what does it mean to have an equity interest in the corporation? Well, it's a matter of the nature of the holding, timing, and whether the plaintiff has countervailing interests. And so there are some issues there about owning shares in a voting trust, owning shares in the street name, uh, owning shares and shorting them. And so shorting shares is an example of a countervailing interest. So standing gets a little bit more interesting, but you know, most of these are your vanilla case where some dude owns some stock or some lady owns some stock, hires a lawyer, or the lawyer probably calls her and says, hey, lady, I heard you had some stock. I'd like to sue this company. Would you like to be the plaintiff representing the class? And uh, usually that's kind of away, away she goes. All right, so that's, uh, that's the nuts and bolts of shareholder litigation. Uh, there are a couple references you should be aware of. The ALI Principle 701 was referenced. I did mention FRCP, which parallels DGCL 23.1, uh, DGCL 141 as well, regarding the role of directors in running the company. And our cases, Thule, Aronson, uh, and Zapata, and Einhorn. I didn't cover Auerbach, actually. Let me see. I needed to say something about Auerbach. Uh, oh, yeah, our, our, I, I actually didn't include it because it's yet another case where the SLC's decision was upheld. Uh, so uh, here, General Electric Telephone filed a derivative suit, um, formed an SLC. The SLC concluded there was no violation, moved to dismiss the suit. Does the business judgment rule protect the SLC? And the answer is yes. The SLC is protected by the Special Litigation Committee. But that business judgment protection is a little bit less than what directors get because the court did allow investigation into the independence and uh, ability of the uh, procedural ability of the SLC to make a valid recommendation. All right, so there you have shareholder litigation question. to force the board to have an SLC as, a, as opposed to simply deciding as a matter of directors that they would, they would not sue. I don't believe there's a, an actual procedural method, but given that the SLC's decision, if the board themselves is, there, there's, you mean because they'd have less deference? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think the board would be able to, to convene determine that the suit should be dismissed and dismiss the suit, provided that there's a sufficient number of disinterested directors on the board. If on the other, I guess, the, you know what, here's the way to do it. You would simply, I think, or colorably allege that a majority of the directors are interested, such that you couldn't even have a quorum of directors that were disinterested. And that would necessitate an SLC, or, you know, you have to be able to make that claim in good faith. That would probably be the tactic there. Other questions about shareholder litigation? So let's talk about board decision making. And here we have the business judgment rule, among other concepts, talking briefly about the reasons for the BJR and its exceptions and the requirement for informed uh, decision making, as we saw in Smith v. Van Gorkum, as well as some ways to avoid liability, 
uh, and effectively put ourselves in a world that uh, existed before uh, the Van Gorkum case. What are fiduciary duties? Well, all agents owe fiduciary duties to their principles. It's a concept in agency law that agents owe duties to their principles, but corporate agents, directors, officers, are, are unique, are sui generis, are, are special. And there's a certain special set of rules pertaining to the agency rate relationship between shareholders and the officers and directors of a corporation. Uh, and that leads us to the business uh, judgment rule, which is effectively a rule of deference to these particular agents because we want to maintain that separation of ownership and control. So these duties in general, duty of care, to act honestly, act in good faith, and in informed manner in the best interest of the corporation, the duty of loyalty, avoid self-dealing, avoid conflicts of interest. Uh, you can see obviously there's some similarities even there. Um, the best interest of the corporation versus your own interests. So there's actually always been some blurry lines, but the duty of oversight has really blurred the lines between these two doctrines because the duty of a corporate officer to institute oversight uh, dashboards and to make sure that the business is not engaged in illegal activity or super risky activity has been framed as a duty of care issue, duty of loyalty issue. But I think a couple cases will help clarify at least the, the milestone cases on either side of the spectrum. As I mentioned, the business judgment rule protects most decisions by boards and, uh, as we saw in our box, special litigation committees. And it's been related to a gross negligence standard in torts, meaning that boards have to do something more than mere negligence to be found liable. However, if a director has a conflict of interest, if they stand on both sides of a transaction or if they usurp a business opportunity, well, they lose that business judgment deference. And as a result, we care very much about those duty of loyalty breaches those are the areas where shareholders will be able to sue where there is less uh, shielding of director activity. And there's this sort of new up and coming idea that directors are also liable for failure to protect against risks, uh, uh, failure to monitor kind of concerns. I'd like to think of that as sort of a third duty that at least to me sets up the false dichotomy between duty of loyalty and duty of care, but I will tell you that's not the prevailing view. Uh, most folks would say there's a duty of care, there's a duty of loyalty, and the duty of oversight falls in one or the other category depending on the nature of the oversight failure. Seems to me like these you know, concepts are much fuzzier than, than we've been led to believe, and there's overlaps already, and the oversight pushes it. It doesn't really matter much because every duty of care claim is effectively a non-starter. So. You know, basically all the lawsuits will have to focus on some duty of loyalty breach, and we do see that as the evolution of the oversight claims has gone on. So what does the BJR do? Judges won't second guess for decisions that are within a realm of reason. That's a pretty, pretty big realm, uh, and kind of re creates this gross negligence standard. So the plaintiff has to show that the directors basically violated the duty of loyalty in order to have their decisions challenged, either by acting in self-dealing, acting in bad faith, or making a decision that isn't really a business decision. Why? Well, judges aren't business people. Uh, you know, they might hear all sorts of cases in a given day, not even all business cases, plus every business is unique. And moreover, the shareholders, they got these agents to run the thing for them, to run the corporation for them. So who's the, who's the judge to second guess the decision of the person that they put in charge? Uh, without this business judgment rule, we would have a lot less certainty that corporations could, in fact, do what they say they're going to do to fulfill their, their contracts. Uh, we would basically not have the corporate structure we do today. The first case we saw that exemplified this was our case about nice, night baseball, uh, Schlen Schlensky versus Wrigley. Right? And here's Wrigley Field with the lights on, but as you remember, the lights were kept off at Wrigley Field for a long time because um, Wrigley, who uh, was the majority shareholder and controlled the board, said that baseball is a daytime sport, and he felt strongly that the Cubs should not play at night, so he refused to install lights. Now, he did say a couple things that were helpful in his case. He kind of insinuated that folks wouldn't necessarily want to come to downtown, the, the type of people that are Cubs fans might not want to come to downtown Chicago at night, and he talked about you know, keeping the neighborhood up to a certain uh, standard. 
which could be perceived as corporate social responsibility or could be perceived as a business decision to try to keep the Cubs uh, of a certain nature, I guess. I mean, you look at the year, it's 1968, it's a while ago, so maybe that thinking made some sense, maybe it didn't make a lot of sense, but it doesn't have to make perfect sense, it doesn't have to be the best decision. A director is permitted to make a decision that's in the realm of reason. And not playing baseball at night, the court found, was well within the realm of reason. It wasn't totally unreasonable, it wasn't wasteful. Um, and so when Schlensky sues and says, play baseball at night, uh, or you're violating your duties to me, the shareholder, the court says no. This was a business decision, and Wrigley wins. Sort of our classic case of the power of the business judgment rule. But this power didn't last. Um, in Smithy Van Gorkum, at least, the corporate world was shaken to a certain extent. Now we're in 1985 and realize that directors might actually be liable that the business judgment rule does not protect everything. The background was a little complex. There was an issue of too much tax credits and, a, and not clear how to sort of spend them or use them. And a decision was made for the company to sell itself. And, uh, and so it went and sought out uh, a buyer. It ended up talking to Jay Pritzker, uh, who with his brother Tom were billionaires from the Hyatt fortune. And the CEO, Jerome uh, Van Gorkum, he was an interesting guy on, in his right too, but he kind of he talked to Pritzker on the side and negotiated this deal to a large extent without a lot of the board's involvement and basically presented it to the board on a lovely day in September the 20th, if you're wondering, 1980. He made a 20-minute presentation, shorter than I've talked to you so far. And in that time, convinced them that he had a good offer to sell the company for $55 a share uh, with a lockup provision, et cetera, et cetera. So after this 20-minute speech and a slightly longer meeting, the board decided to approve this sale of the company. Well, the board did meet, but some questions later arose about uh, whether or not this 20-minute presentation and two-hour meeting was sufficient paper and process for the board to actually be exercising a business judgment. Um, there are a lot of questions that weren't asked. There are a lot of experts that weren't consulted. There are a lot of problems with this process, and there was no reason to believe $55 was the right amount. It was kind of random. So a shareholder sued, and you know this case actually got interesting. Uh, of course, the lower court found for the directors, said the business judgment rule applies, but actually on appeal, uh, the directors lost their business judgment rule protection, and the Court of Chancellery found the directors reliable. There was an interesting story with the settlement and charity and what have you, but what this really stood for was in order for the board to enjoy the business judgment rule protection, they had to engage in a certain level of paper and process. 20-minute presentation, two-hour meeting, not enough process for this particular type of transaction. And so we start to see that there are some limits to the business judgment rule. Now, even if a court doesn't, a board does not proceed with paper and process, there is ways they can continue to avoid lawsuits and put themselves in a world as if Van Gorkum never happened. And the way you kind of un-Van Gorkumize your company is you have an exculpation provision in your charter. Exculpation is a provision in charter which eliminates or reduces the liability of directors for money damages. And in response to the Van Gorkum ruling, a uh, number of states permitted these type of provisions to be incorporated, and including Delaware. Now there are some limits to this as well, uh, but uh, for example you can't indemnify or exculpate against breaches of the duty of loyalty or in bad faith or uh, unlawful activity, but you can exculpate against a failure of paper and process. And so if a corporation has an exculpation provision and they have a two-hour meeting and approve a sale of the company, that exculpation provision, provided that there's no bad faith or any issue with loyalty, that exculpation provision would probably protect a director who has exculpation, as if Van Gorkum never, never happened. The limits of it are not entirely clear, but the reason that we're more comfortable with this exculpation provision than a blanket rule that directors don't have to observe paper and process is shareholders can read the charter and they can decide, for one thing, shareholders can 
uh, vote to change the bylaws and the charter, and they can choose whether or not to invest in a corporation that has these provisions. Um, so we see this, and, and the rule from this is uh, 102B7 in the Delaware General Corporate Law. And that's one way to eliminate or limit liability for directors. Another is indemnification, where the corporation will step into the shoes of a director who's being sued. And under indemnification, the corporation will pay for the lawsuit, um, uh, and so the director does not have to do so. And there are a number of provisions here. I invite you to take a look back uh, specifically. Section 145A, for example, pertains to class actions, 145B to derivative suits. So it's fairly technical, and I'll leave it to you to, to parse back through that. Our third area of protection is insurance. And just like any insurance, you can protect against a certain type of loss by buying insurance. DNO insurance is expensive. And like car insurance, if you get in too many accidents, it can be revoked. Plus, there's usually a copayment or a deductible associated with it. So in some ways, it's more limited. But since it is a private agreement, it can be pretty broad. And it can cover things that even indemnification cannot. And the DGCL also authorizes the use of insurance. Yes? Uh, the Delaware rule for exculpation is 102B7, and that discusses specifically the contents of the certificate of incorporation. That's why it's in a different section than the indemnification. It, it specifically permits, this is 102B7, specifically permits the certificate of in incorporation to ex in include an exculpation provision along the lines of what we discussed. And it's the 145 series from A to G that talks about indemnification and insurance. All right, so that's the basics of the business judgment rule. We have a couple Delaware provisions to keep in mind. As you mentioned, 102B7 relating to exculpation, uh, 145 relating to indemnification and insurance. Uh, I don't focus as much on the MBCA, but you may be interested that there's parallel sections there. Schlensky, the classic case. Van Gorkum, the more modern case creating this rule that we need sufficient paper and process in order for uh, the BJR to attach. Questions? So let's move on to board oversight. What I'm thinking of as the duty of oversight, and it's big enough to have an entire chapter, but in fairness, these claims are characterized as a breach of the duty of care or breach of the duty of loyalty, because those are our main uh, duties that we currently observe, although with Sarbanes-Oxley and other statutes that require monitoring, there might be other statutory rights of action. In any event, we're going to talk about uh, the functions of a director and what's expected of them, especially with regard to their oversight function and how that might be different in a closely held versus a publicly held corporation, uh, these concepts of internal controls, uh, legal compliance programs, and risk management. So what does a director do? Well, they do two main things, really. They make decisions, like actively make decisions, and they oversee the business to prevent it from running off a cliff, right? And so right now we're talking about not necessarily affirmative decisions, but sort of oversight and making sure that everything looks okay. So our classic case, right? like Wrigley here, sort of the extreme case, Francis First United Jersey Bank involved a lady named Miss Pritchard who was... Uh, I guess the expression stand-up drunk is wrong, a drop-down drunk? I don't know, she, was, she didn't even get out of bed. I mean, this woman was completely inattentive and failed completely in her, in her obligations. She was married to a scumbag who was stealing money from the company, along with the scumbag kids. They were all pilfering from the corporate honey jar. And meanwhile, I guess that drove her into some despondency. After her scumbag husband passed, she became even more despondent, never attended board meetings, never even read the financial statements that would have made it obvious to anyone with a 10th grade education that the number, the amount of shareholder borrowing exceeded by a factor of 10 the amount of money the corporation made. And this was supposed to be a kind of fiduciary institution. So Francis V. United Jersey Bank uh, makes it clear that even before Van Gorkum, even before Caremark, 1981, you know, it's a fair, fair bit of time ago, a director cannot avoid liability by staying in bed. Okay? The director has to put down the bottle, go to the meeting, read the accounting statements. Now look, if the director is not very good at that, maybe the director is incredibly bad at math. Well, that's the shareholder's fault. 
The shareholders appoint the director, and you might ask, hey, did you get a 10th grade education in math? Do you know that 10 million is more than 1 million? And do you understand the difference between assets and liabilities? Those are good credentials for a director to have. But it's really the shareholder's fault if the shareholder doesn't ask that and appoints that director anyway. However, once that director is appointed, again, you can't hold them accountable for being stupid, but you can hold them accountable for not getting out of bed and not reading the financial statements. So this was a really extreme case where Ms. Pritchard uh, completely failed in her, in her duties and as a result will be liable under uh, this was a duty of care claim. And this was actually framed in duty of care. Since she didn't even make a decision, nothing was protected by the business judgment rule, and she lost on the duty of care. Um, I mean, there, by the way, there, there is some backstory, as we talked about, why the, course, the case was maybe not as easy as I'm making it seem, because there were some issues of causality in which she had been able to stop them from stealing. But, um, you know... The fact that there were $10 million in shareholder loans in 1975 and $551,000 of income, that's the kind of thing that anybody should notice. She simply didn't read the documents. She literally didn't even get out of bed to go to the meeting. So at some level, uh, oversight has failed. So what do we see here? You know, Where are directors liable for oversight? Well, here was a classic example. She failed to respond to red flags in an egregious way, didn't even show up. And this is the old standard, Granby Alice Chalmers, respond to red flags. If you're presented with something like $10 million in shareholder loans, $500,000 in income, that's a red flag. You need to do something about it. And she didn't see the red flag because she didn't even attend the meetings, really making it an extreme case. But is there some duty to actually look out for this? Is there some duty to create reporting systems? And that gets us to our next case of Caremark, which seems to say that there is. In a shareholder derivative action, plaintiffs claim that Caremark's board of directors breached their duty of care by failing to put in a system that would uh, monitor employees and prevent them from issuing kickbacks. Kickbacks are a way of paying off doctors to prescribe certain drugs. And this manufacturer, I suppose, was, was engaged in that because they ended up paying uh, $250 million in fines for this chronic failure of preventing, uh, preventing their employees from, from providing these kickbacks. And so uh, did the board uh, violate its duty of care uh, by allowing employees to violate the law? Well, you know, this was interesting. That while while the, uh, the case had a weird procedural posture, this was actually an approval of a settlement. Remember that derivative lawsuits need court approval to settle, and the court approved the settlement. So it didn't actually answer the question in a, in a dispositive way. In fact, the court seemed inclined to say, no, we wouldn't hold these directors liable at trial. But the fact that they approved the settlement means there was some reasonable basis for the claim. And this made a lot of people really worried. Now, what do directors have to do to avoid liability? And, uh, and what types of monitoring systems need to be implemented. Uh, you know, was this liability for a director for failure to monitor? Uh, it, seems like, it seems like there now is room for that. It was a, a new statement in director oversight that said that a board of director has an obligation to monitor or supervise corporate performance, at least with regards to legal risks, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, a similar legal risk came up in Stone v. Ritter. In Stone v. Ritter, uh, you know, banks, as you probably know, have to comply with AML, uh, anti-money laundering, and bank secrecy laws. There's a variety of requirements involved with this to, to avoid people from funneling money to terrorist organizations, to avoid you know, drug lords using banking systems, to avoid uh, Ponzi schemes, in fact, uh, to avoid schemes being run through a bank. And such a Ponzi scheme was perpetrated through the AmSouth Bank. And they were supposed to file these suspicious activity reports, and they didn't. So, hey, shareholder sues, says directors, you didn't stop the bad guy from running a Ponzi scheme. You didn't file the SARs, and we had to pay $50 million, which hurt the company, which hurt me derivatively. And so I'm suing. And the plaintiff acknowledged there were no red flags. There was nothing that the directors missed. They weren't asleep at the wheel. But um, 
argued that their monitoring system failed. Actually, what the plaintiff argued, which wasn't true, was that they utterly failed to implement any sort of monitoring system. That was a claim made that just wasn't true. They actually had installed a monitoring system. The problem is the monitoring system was crap, or at least it didn't work. I mean, maybe it was fine. You know, things fall through the cracks, even if you have a good system. But they actually had a system. And so what distinguishes this came from Caremark. In Caremark, there was no system to police for kickbacks. In Stone v. Ritter, there was a system to make sure SARs were filed properly. The system didn't work, but it existed. And so the directors had fulfilled their duty in Stone versus Ritter. So there was this obligation, but it was met because Unlike in CVS and unlike in Francis, there was no utter failure in Stone. There was an information and reporting system. It didn't work, but it was there. You gotta give them credit for trying, right? We don't always have to give them credit for trying, but I guess the court did here. We saw another case which was, again, similar, where there was a, a, a I don't know if there was an oversight system, but. Well, 2008 was a crazy year. A lot of financial businesses were losing a lot of money in 2008. They had various toxic access on their books. I'll talk at the end briefly about CDOs. They own these and other things. And, uh, and, and Citigroup was one of these companies that had a lot of uh, what turned out to be toxic assets on their books. And it tanked the company. I mean, they owned a bunch of garbage. And a shareholder sued, saying that the directors ignored red flags. Uh, they were pursuing short-term profits as opposed to long-term viability of the company. And it, it argued demand was excused. Well, how did this one play out? Well, there's two problems with this claim. One problem is that there wasn't a lack of monitoring systems. The directors knew full well that well, the world was going to hell in a handbasket, okay? 2007 was a terrible year for the banking industry, and they knew that. They weren't uh, oblivious to that, but you had to make a decision. You have a trillion dollars in potentially toxic assets. No one necessarily wants to buy them. Do you sell them for pennies on the dollar? Do you hold on and hope for something else? Well, they knew that. They had that information. They made a choice. That's called a business decision. That was an exercise of business judgment, and as a result, it was protected by the business judgment rule. Moreover, the court holds that we need to distinguish between legal risks, like we saw with AmSouth and like we saw in Caremark, versus business risks. And so there are two reasons why uh, this claim should fail. So to recap that on board oversight, we have some MBCA provisions, uh, DGCL, again, the exculpation provision comes up here because it can reduce the liability of directors. Uh, we talked about Francis, Granby Alice Traumer's old law, uh, in Caremark, newer law, right? Al Granby Alice Chalmers don't need to ferret out wrongdoing. That's not true anymore. In Caremark, yes, you do. You have to implement monitoring systems. Stone v. Ritter, so long as they work, uh, so long as they are in place, they may not necessarily have to work to avoid liability, but I'm sure it helps. And uh, Citigroup, that financial risk is, <coughs> is different than legal risk. And in fact, business judgments will continue to be protected under the business judgment rule, even when they're catastrophic. Questions? Next, we have director conflicts. The duty of loyalty, and this is where we really get to see some action uh, where, where shareholders begin to win. We're going to talk about self-dealing transactions. That's kind of the conventional understanding. Directors on both sides. They're on the board of uh, a particular company, and maybe that's doing a transaction with another company that they are a shareholder in or a director in or personal. Um, there's a process. For once we've identified what these DCITs look like, we can cleanse them, we can put them through the ringer, and we can fix that. It's one of the major roles of corporate attorneys is identifying these transactions and cleansing them so they don't result in liability. And thankfully, there are some safe harbors so we can have some confidence about how to do that. And then we'll talk about the corporate opportunity doctrine and, uh, and, and how that plays out. All right, so what is a DCIT? A DCIT or director conflict of interest transaction is when a director stands on both sides of a given transaction. This is not necessarily prohibited. In fact, it may be beneficial. An example I like to give is, I don't know, Andreessen Horowitz, a venture capital firm, invests in, I don't know, Uber, Lyft, 
right? And so one of these companies now has a director on their board. Great, probably pretty helpful, really good venture capital company. So Uber needs some more money. Well, great, we can call our friend, Paul, the director, who's a principal at Andreessen Horowitz and see if Andreessen will fund our next round. That's actually super helpful, but there's a problem. Paul, as I mentioned, is the principal at Andreessen Horowitz and he's on the board of directors at Lyft. So he stands on both sides of the transaction. Should we prevent this transaction from going forward? Is there something inherently unforgivably wrong about it? No, but we should be careful. So the issue is whether the transaction is fair and we're not going to necessarily avoid the transaction because there is this conflict. Uh, in the case of Remilliard Brick, we saw a pretty nasty conflict and we saw one of many examples where California gets the law wrong and then fixes it in a crazy way, uh, half fixes it. So this is sort of interesting. The California law was written really badly and, and had a loophole that a judge fixed by ignoring the law, which is an odd place for judges, but I guess, hey, you know, when you're out west, you gotta, you gotta roll with the punches. So what happened in this case? Stanley and Sturgis owned a big block of shares, a majority of shares in Romiliar Dandini and controlled the board. Um, including its wholly owned subsidiary. And uh, long story short, what effectively they did was they set up a second company that they entirely owned. So they were majority owners of the current company. They set up a new company they entirely owned. They had the company they controlled but did not entirely own uh, provide the bricks at cost, their materials at cost, to the sales company. The sales company that they entirely owned then sold the bricks at a profit. So they effectively took all the profit from the collectively owned company and put all the profit in the company they own by themselves. So instead of making, let's say they own 60% of the shares, they would have had 60% of the profit, now they get 100%. That's great, right? Well, for them, not so great for the other shareholders, which are now making zilch on their investment. And these shareholders got a little upset about it, but, uh, but Stanley and Sturgis argued that they had actually put this transaction to a vote. And, uh, and under the current California statute, uh, no interested contract is void or voidable if there is director approval, if there is shareholder approval, or if the deal is fair. It neglected to add the word disinterested director approval and disinterested shareholder approval. So the judge read that into the case, and we see the error of having DCITs be able to be approved by the conflicted directors. And this is just a kind of an early stage reminder as we're moving toward our actual doctrine that matters that what we're looking for is approval by disinterested directors and approval by disinterested shareholders. That's how we cleanse the transaction. If the shareholders that approve it are interested in the transaction, if the directors that approve it are benefiting from the transaction, it doesn't have the cleansing effect, as should be. Uh, we saw a case that worked out a little bit better in Benihana of Tokyo, a really colorful case, uh, a colorful characters. We had Rocky Aoki, uh, the former wrestler turned restauranteur who died of hepatitis C caused by a bad blood infusion that he got by crashing his racing boat into the Golden Gate Bridge, among other tales. And he created this hibachi grill because that's what you do when you're a billionaire restaurateur, speedboater, wrestler guy. So he owned this company and then got himself into some, some trouble with the... Um, the SEC, and ended up having a certain type of structure where he effectively still owned a majority of shares in his company. But there was a problem. The company needed some money. It didn't have anywhere good to get it. So in order to get money, you had to give something to get something. Give money from a bank, get a loan. You know That wasn't forthcoming for this company. So how else can a company raise money? Well, they can sell stock. Problem with selling stock is that stock is a percentage. So let's say you have 501 out of 1,000 shares. The company sells five more shares. You've now gone from a majority, 501 out of 1,000 is a majority, to less than a majority. 501 out of 1,005 is not a majority, and you no longer control the company. That's pretty much what happened here. Uh, Benny Hanna decided to raise money by selling shares to a investment firm, and um, and this would dilute Aoki's ownership such that he would no longer control the company. And the reason that he was able to sue is that John Abdo, a member of his board, was also a principal in this investment fund. 
John Abdo stood on both sides of the transaction. Just like the venture capital Paul at Andreessen Horowitz I mentioned in the example earlier. So should we preclude this transaction? No, but we have to make sure it is cleansed. And what happened here? Well, the other directors were well aware of Abdo's position. In fact, Abdo negotiated publicly on behalf of his firm, abdicated his responsibility to Benihana. The board of directors, with full information about the roles being played, voted to approve the transaction after months of trying to find somebody to pay money to this crazy idea of a restaurant. And as a result, the transaction was cleansed, much to Aoki's chagrin. As you can see, he sued. But this was not self-dealing because Delaware General Corporation Law, DGCL Section 144, is expressed. DGCL creates a safe harbor for interested director transactions that have been cleansed by a approval of the disinterested directors. It can also be cleansed by approval of disinterested shareholders, but here we have the disinterested director approval. Uh, so how do we deal with these? As I mentioned, section 144, we have the cleansing process. Subchapter F of MBCA also provides a, a kind of a brighter line. Well, it's brighter and dimmer. I, I talked about that at length over the lesson. The Delaware law is actually not technically a safe harbor. It simply says the transaction's not automatically void or voidable. The safe harbor comes about as a virtue of case law that the Delaware judges have not allowed an action to proceed even though they technically could. So it's not a statutory safe harbor, but the statute is nice and clear, and the judges have followed it as if it were a safe harbor. Subchapter F of the MBCA, it's written as a safe harbor, but its terms are cloudy enough that it's not clear how judges would enforce it. In any event, we're focusing on Delaware as our jurisdiction, and if we have approval by disinterested directors, we're okay. So we can have approval by the disinterested board or the disinterested shareholders. We can also go through a process of evaluating the transaction for procedural fairness or ugh, structural or substantive fairness as well. We'll talk about those. Procedural fairness involves looking at the transaction and how it was approved, right? The procedure, whether the transaction was approved with paper and process, whether the decision makers had full and fair information, whether they had those reports that were not present in Van Gorkum that they would have liked, whether they were able to be objective and helpful if the shareholders also having this information ratify the transaction. Substantive fairness, well, now the court's basically, th this is basically means you've lost your business judgment rule and the court is making its own business judgment, which is dangerous. So if the court's made its own business judgment, what will it consider? These are factors from Schlensky. There are more factors, but um, Effectively, the court could consider anything. It's very dangerous ground because now the court is going to substitute its judgment for whether this was a good or bad transaction. All right, when does a director have a disabling interest in a transaction? Uh, we, we're going to distinguish here uh, interest, uh, DCIT, versus lacking independence. So how can we tell if a director has a disabling interest? Well, there are two ways. The first is the director personally receives a financial benefit but not like five bucks, not like a bottle of wine at a Christmas party, a, uh, a substantial financial benefit. And that benefit has to be at the result of the transaction in question, and that benefit has to be not shared. I mean, if everyone is getting five bucks, the shareholders have no right to complain. It's if that, that director is getting that on their own. And that benefit, I say five bucks, it, I mean, directors make generally quite a bit more. The benefit has to be of such subjective material importance that it is reasonable to question whether it would jeopardize their objectivity. So large rewards. Or on the other hand, the director stands on both sides, done. If the director is on both sides of the transaction, they have a disabling interest, done. So either receiving a material award that's not shared or standing on both sides. Lacking independence kind of gets us back to that conversation about structural bias. When does a director lack independence? when they are not dominated by or beholden to another. Now this is obviously a more nebulous standard. One thing that's clear, this is not about a benefit to that director, but a benefit to someone that director cares about or that cares about him in a controlling kind of way. The plaintiff also has to plead particularized facts, manifesting a direction of corporate contract conduct in such a way as to comport with the wishes or interests of person doing the controlling. 
Short version, interested means personal financial benefit. Interested means personal financial benefit. Not independent means controlled or beholden to another. Not independent means controlled by or beholden to another. So this came up in Oracle, which was an interesting case, also involving a special litigation committee and a derivative suit. Here, the special litigation committee was comprised of, well, academics from Stanford, actually. And the issue here was that Oracle Corporation gave a lot of money to Stanford. Now, this was an established, chaired professor who you would think would be somewhat insulated by, uh, by his position, a permanent position. But even so, the court found, uh, going back to that notion that the SLC should be beyond reproach, like Caesar's wife, the SLC needed to be comprised of directors that were beyond reproach and were um, fundamentally independent. And the idea that this person's job was related to a major source of funding at this institution uh, suggested, at least on an SLC level, that, uh, that these members were uh, controlled or beholden to Oracle. And so uh, the SLC was not disinterested, and so the SLC's recommendation in this case was not valid. We saw a bit of a different result in the Martha Stewart case. Uh, in Martha Stewart, uh, the uh, directors, not an SLC, the directors themselves, I think this gets back to your question, the directors uh, decided to dismiss a suit. Now, they were actually pretty close with Martha. Allegations included Martha Stewart and other directors moved in the same social circles, attended the same weddings, developed business relationships, described each other as friends. And Martha Stewart had 94% voting power, so she doesn't like the director. Right? She controls the board. Even so, even so, the court did not apply the structural bias argument to Martha Stewart. Well, that's interesting. Why? Well, I think the easiest answer is that special litigation committees are held to a different standard than boards of directors. If we allow the structural bias argument to permeate the board of directors, maybe we erode the business judgment rule more than we're comfortable with. The SLC continues to be held to a higher standard, and so I think what we're seeing here is effectively a different standard employed in these two different cases. Okay, uh, other key cases in this chapter, Lewis v. Vogelstein, uh, which was a Mattel, uh, Mattel Corporation case. So a shareholder suit challenged the stock option compensation plan for the directors of Mattel. You know, they are the ultimate arbiters of, of granting of stock and stock options, and um, they gave themselves a, a nice package. So was it a breach of the duty of loyalty for the directors to give themselves the shareholder package? Well. They had a good lawyer, I suppose, and the lawyer said, yeah, you probably should get shareholder approval. So they did. They got independent shareholder approval to give themselves a big lump of stock options. Did that save the transaction? It did. It did because shareholder approval, independent shareholder approval, can cleanse a DCIT so long as the ratification was informed. Uh, and Delaware 144 uh, speaks about that directly. So it was ratified and therefore uh, we're okay. What is the waste doctrine? This comes up from time to time. The waste doctrine is an allegation that the corporation was caused to basically set its money on fire or give it away as a gift by buying something at a price so absurd that it is effectively giving a gift. And this came up in the case of Harbor finance partners. A shareholder uh, alleged that, um, uh, so actually backing up, Republic Industries bought AutoNation. And a Republic Industries shareholder argued that that transaction was self-interested because the Republic directors themselves owned AutoNation stock. Well, clearly you're on both sides because when you buy a company, the money goes to the shareholders and the money's coming to you and you're the director of the acquirer. You're on both sides, right? It's DCIT, you have a direct financial interest. You're interested in the transaction. But it got shareholder approval. 
does shareholder approval cleanse a transaction? What do you think? Yes, it does. Of course it does. Shareholder approval cleanses it so long as it is an informed shareholder vote. This shareholder vote was informed, uncoerced by disinterested shareholders. A vote by informed, disinterested shareholders will cleanse a DCIT just as a vote by informed, disinterested directors will as well. What then is the corporate opportunity doctrine? It's a subset of the duty of loyalty that addresses common conflicts where a director usurps a corporate opportunity. So it's a little different than being on both sides, maybe uh, different enough that it gets its own uh, uh, name. And we have this doctrine because there's also some competing interests. I mean, directors of a corporation are often directors on multiple corporations. Sometimes they have their own businesses that they run. They may be entrepreneurs in their own right. Directors do make a lot of money, but for this kind of level of person who is a, a director, the actual salary for being a director is not necessarily that high. So engaging some of these folks uh, who are operating that level means giving them some laterality to continue pursuing their own business ends. So we try to balance that with the corporate opportunity doctrine to make sure they remain uh, uh, effective agents while at the same time incentivizing them to continue working for the company. So we had this in Guth v. Loft. Uh, this was a case about a retail candy store. The Coca-Cola company refused to give Guth, uh, or Loft Inc., rather. Uh, Guth ran Loft Inc., and Loft Inc. had a contract with Coca-Cola, but Coca-Cola wouldn't give them a volume discount. And uh, Guth, who ran the store, said, well, there's this Pepsi company, and it's like in bankruptcy. So he bought Pepsi in bankruptcy, and he then sold Pepsi-Cola to Loft Soda Fountains. So did Guth divert a corporate opportunity to himself? Did he usurp a corporate opportunity? Did he violate the corporate opportunity doctrine by purchasing Pepsi instead of giving Loft, Inc., the opportunity to purchase it. Yes, he did. And we have an initial test, not the final test, but sort of the traditional early stage test from 1939. A corporate fiduciary cannot take a business opportunity for himself if it is one the corporation could financially undertake, it is within the line of the corporation's business and is advantageous to the corporation and it is one in which the corporation has a reasonable uh, interest or expectancy. So this expanded the corporate opportunity, uh, opportunity doctrine and, and we have this kind of broad framing uh, because a lot of things can fall into this category. However, the story doesn't end there. A more modern version is in Farber vs. Servant Land Company. I really like this case most because I found this GIF and I get to keep this on the screen while I'm talking about it. I mean, how many classes do you get to teach where there's a dog putting a golf ball? Well, it's relevant to the case because this is a case about a golf course. Servant was an entity created to buy land. Servant Land Company created to buy land and build a golf course. Servant and Serini were majority shareholders. They controlled the company and Farquhar, real name, uh, offered to send an adjoining 160-acre tract to Servin. Now, is this within the expectancy of the company? Well, sure. I mean, this is a land company. This is the parcel of land next to the parcel owned by the land company on which there is a golf course. Golf courses require, you guessed it, land. So was the sale of land within the interest or expectancy of the corporation? Well, almost certainly, but let's take a look at the corporate opportunity tests and see how they apply, as well as the ways that Servant and Serini tried to cleanse this. All right, the interest or expectancy test. Uh, was this opportunity in the interest or expectancy of the corporation? Almost certainly the purchase of an adjoining parcel of land is within the interest of a land company that owns land. Line of business test, is it in the same line of business? Yeah, owning land and buying land such that you own land would be the same line of business, namely owning land in the land company. The economic capacity test, that gets a little more tricky. Did the corporation have the ability to take it on? Uh, that one is not as clear from the facts, but it seems like it was. Uh, and then you can get into kind of fairness tests, uh, which are difficult because the court has to evaluate them. And finally, the 
corporate rejection test, whether or not the corporation rejected the offer. And that's the test that Servan and Serini want to apply. They suggest that the corporation rejected the opportunity to buy the land, but there is a problem with that rejection. Servan and Serini presented the proposal, and they made it sound like a really stinky proposal. The shareholders did not have sufficient information to make that decision. And if we learn nothing else from the previous cases where the cleansing occurred, we saw at least that that cleansing occurred because the shareholders or directors who were disinterested had full and fair information. Here, they were found not to have had full and fair information about its value, and therefore the transaction is voidable. And the share and they effectively functions as Servant and Serini are trustees to hold the money for the Servant Land Company shareholders. So that gets us to the end of board oversight. We had DGCL 122 and 144. Subchapter F is that safe harbor that I referenced, which is kind of quasi safe harbor. Um, if you're interested, you know, the ALI Principles 501 gets into a little more detail. We briefly touched on Remilliard Brick, kind of an old case in California that showed how disinterested is a key feature of cleansing. Benihana of Tokyo, full and fair disclosure, cleansing by directors. Uh, don't worry about Orman. Uh, Henry Oracle, we contrasted with Martha Stewart. One had an SLC, one did not. Did that make the difference? Maybe. Louis V. Vogelstein and Harbor par uh, Partners also involved a cleansing transaction. Both were cleansed. Booth v. Loft, corporate opportunity doctrine is introduced. There was no even attempt to cleanse it. Defines the broad corporate opportunity doctrine. And finally, Farber uh, versus Servan and Serini in Servan Land Company, uh, an example of a failure to cleanse a transaction because the directors and shareholders who cleansed did not have sufficient paper and process. So that's fiduciary duties. Anything before we move on? Let's talk about securities markets a little bit. So let's start here for a second. So just as a reminder, what do shareholders do to effectuate their rights? They have three main ways to effectuate their rights. Voting, which we talked about predominantly last semester, and you could classify generally as corporate governance. That includes information rights and to a certain extent shareholder activism. Shareholders though can also sue and we just talked at length about the reasons shareholders can sue directors for a breach of directors fiduciary obligations to them either directly to them or derivatively to the corporation. And to a limited extent shareholders can sell their shares of stock protecting themselves by exiting a transaction which is not valuable. So what rules govern this? Well, there are many, but the fundamental ones are the 1933 Securities Act and the 1934 Exchange Act, affectionately known as the 33 Act and the 34 Act, for those of us that don't care about any other acts passed in those given years. Uh, there's also you know, many other uh, laws pertaining to this, the 1940 Investment Advisors Act, the 1940 Investment Company Act, Sarbanes-Oxley, Dodd-Frank, the Jobs Act. We talked about all those in some detail, but these, these are the main ones. So what do they uh, uh, do? Okay, where am I going? Okay, just had to check for it. So what do they do? Uh, one, Securities Act of 1933 defines a security. And those are common things, including stocks and bonds. Specific things like fractional undivided interests in mineral rights, and a broad catch-all term called an investment contract, which relates to, which, which is defined by the Howey test. We're going to focus here on stock, on stock. And, uh, and so we're not worried too much at this level of what could be classified as a security, but it is the Howey test, a four-part test that, that defines non-stock things that could be securities. Um, and uh, Backgroundy stuff. I mean, you probably know this, but the securities markets evolved over a very long period of time in American history and are, in fact, international. We now have two main securities markets in New York, the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange, but there are also regional stock markets. So when we talk about companies that are public or, on, or, or are private, 
Companies that are public, we're talking about companies that are traded on an exchange, and the ones that matter are usually traded on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange, although it could be others as well. Prior to these acts, we had blue sky laws. Blue sky laws are laws that states pass to regulate sales of securities, but they were irregularly enforced, they were uh, confusing between the states, they made interstate commerce difficult, and one thing that the Securities Act did was it preempted these state laws. So long as you comply with the Securities Act, you didn't have to worry about all these pesky state laws, which was uh, uh, super helpful. And we spoke at fair length, and I have a separate video on this, so I won't take the time now, about the process of going public. And that video is posted on YouTube as well. So you can review that video to really relate to that process. But key things to remember were that the going public process involves cultivating a relationship with these underwriters, these investment banks. And it's actually the investment banks which are going to pay the company. The investment bank gets the stock. They file a report with the SEC. It's called an S-1. We saw an S-1 statement. The front page of it has some information about how many shares are being issued and how much money is being earned. All this is public. There are a lot of risk factors involved. We saw a video with uh, kind of a marketing video from Coca-Cola emphasizing how there's a PR aspect to all of this. And this is trying to get the market juiced up uh, so that folks are ready to buy that at the public offering. And it's actually the underwriters that make the money on the pop. And you probably read recently about Lyft, didn't have so much of a pop, is still below the original offering price. It's the underwriters that are left holding the bag. It's not good for the company either because it's hard for the company to raise money in the future, but the underwriters play a key role in the IPO process. And, uh, and that is required by the 1933 Act. Uh, what is Regulation D? Regulation D is the main way of avoiding that process and still selling stock. Regulation D is predominantly predominated, uh, promulgated under Rule 4.2, although for reasons that are more esoteric than our present needs, Section 3B of the Securities Act is also implicated, at least with regards to Rule 504. But um, you can think of this as simply a regulation that the SEC promulgated to clearly establish a safe harbor for the sale of stock without registration. And the primary ways to do that, traditionally it was really just 506B. Now we have a bunch of new ways to do that as well, but they're all caught up within this Regulation D exemption uh, uh, for, for sales of stock. And plus there are new, newfangled things coming out, Regulation A, Regulation CF, that we briefly talked about. But effectively, these exemptions from registration are, are very helpful because you can avoid that huge expense of filing uh, the S-1 and going public and finding an underwriter, et cetera, et cetera. And so Reg D is this way to sell stock without going public versus an IPO where you go public as I mentioned, please see the video on going public for more on that process. Once a company is public, it is subject to, I mean, even a non-public company is subject to securities fraud, but now you're a really big target for securities fraud. So let's talk briefly about securities fraud. Um, generally, these are going to be class actions, meaning they're direct lawsuits in a class action format. They have a statutory basis. Uh, they are elements to consider of materiality, scienter, reliance, and causation. And there are some issues as well. So where does securities fraud law come from? It comes from the Securities Exchange Act. We were just talking about the Securities Act of 1933. Now we're talking about the Exchange Act of 1934, which governs roughly the trading of securities. And under Section 10B, of the Exchange Act, we have this anti-fraud provision that, similar to 4.2, resulting in Reg D, Section 10B led the SEC to promulgate Rule 10B-5. But just note that 10B-5 is promulgated because of statutory authority. It's a rule, but it's a rule that has express statutory authority in the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, Section 10B. Anyway, Section 10b-5 says it's unlawful for a person directly or indirectly to employ any device, scheme, or artifice to defraud in the connection with the purchase or sale of any security. 
And that's all good and well, but the judge-made law, the, the common law on this, has actually added to that a fair bit. And so we have these additional requirements. For example, who has standing to sue? Who has standing to sue? Who can sue for a 10b-5 violation? Well, there is both a private right and a public right of action. The Securities and Exchange Commission can definitely sue. They're the government watchdog. In addition, a plaintiff who is private must be an actual purchaser or seller to sue for fraud. A non-trader, someone who did not buy stock because of a fraud, does not have standing to sue. You had to actually buy or sell the stock. Now, of course, you can see how a fraud by someone who did not buy stock could be harmful. Like you thought that the company was bad and it was really good, so you didn't buy it. You were harmed. Sorry, you can't sue under 10b-5. Who can be sued? Who can be a target of a 10b-5? Only, quote, primary violators. Primary violators whose own statements induced the trading. For example, someone who aids and abets cannot be a defendant in a 10b-5 action. Where is suit brought? Well, uh, under uniform federal limitations, uh, statute of limitations periods apply. Uh, stockholders who are induced to fraud not to sell cannot sue in state court. They have to sue in federal court. Out of minor jurisdictional issues. So then our key elements that we need to remember in making a claim, and I think you did an exercise on this, so hopefully this rings a bell, uh, we need to show that there was materiality, a materially false or misleading statement, that there was scienter, that the statement was made with an intention to deceive, kind of a mens rea concept, uh, reliance that the plaintiff actually relied on the statement, and that causation element that that reliance caused, uh, caused the loss. So let's take a look at those particular uh, elements. What is materiality? It's actually not defined in the securities laws. That comes from TSC Industries versus Northway, where the Supreme Court found that information is material, quote, if there is a substantial likelihood a reasonable investor would consider it important. There must be a substantial likelihood that the disclosure of the omitted facts would have been viewed by the reasonable investor as having significantly altered the total mix of information available. That's the guidance from the Supreme Court on what this, what this means. <clears throat> uh, actually, leaving this for a, a second. Um, this definition, by the way, this definition from TSC Industries was originally in a different context. The TSC Industries case was a case involving a proxy contest, a false statement in a proxy contest, not related to a securities issuance, but related, I think it was, to a director uh, appointment, shareholder voting. Later, in the case of Basic Incorporated versus Levinson, the, the Supreme Court, again, took this language and applied it directly to securities fraud class actions under 10b-5. So the standard is written in TSC Industries, but it was actually applied to securities fraud in the case of Basic Inc. versus Levinson. What is scienter? Scienter means a culpable state of mind, a uh, sort of a bad uh, state of mind. And the Supreme Court in 76 said that with regard to securities fraud, scienter is a mental state embracing intent to deceive, manipulate, or defraud. So this means we need something more than mere negligence. We need some real culpability here in addition to negligence. The defendant must be actually aware of the truth and in apprehension of the possibility that their statement might be uh, misleading. And the uh, scienter uh, element was a major issue in the uh, case of Telabs Incorporated, Teller, uh, Telabs Inc. versus Maker Issues and Rights, where the Supreme Court uh, 
uh, tried to resolve, a, a, at the time, a circuit split in this issue. And uh, just to review here, sorry. Uh, in Telabs, regarding the scienter element, which I think is better stated here as to what it is, uh, found that courts must uh, accept all factual allegations and motion to dismiss as true, um, but the claims of scienter must be pled with particularity. So you need to have this sort of higher pleading standard uh, for fraud. So courts will consider the complaint in its entirety, including other sources, in determining whether to dismiss. And we need to find a strong inference of scienter based on particular facts, even though, just like with all motions to dismiss, we take the statements as if they were true. We still need to have a pleading with particularity. That's the addition Telabs made to the scienter requirement as established in Ernst and Ernst. Uh, we also have this concept about fraud on the market, which uh, is the idea that uh, even if you do not communicate a fraud to an individual, other market participants can be harmed. Reliance by investors in developed securities markets is presumed to have some type of efficient market hypothesis at work, meaning that the price that they're trading at reflects publicly available information in the general mix. And so if someone is to distribute false or misleading information, maybe not to you, but to you, uh, that can still affect your perception of the stock price uh, because the efficient market hypothesis suggests that uh, this information gets integrated uh, into the price. As a reminder, what is the efficient market hypothesis? Uh, it's, a, it's a theory. It's a theory that came out of the University of Chicago. Uh, not a particularly popular one at the moment, at least not in strong form, because it doesn't seem to necessarily hold up. But it is the theory that states asset prices reflect all available information, and in a strong form, uh, that means that since the price includes all the information, both public and private, it is not possible to seek alpha. It's not possible to get excessive returns. The price reflects all the information. There is no way to do better than the market because there is no such thing as information the market doesn't have. But um, some people do better than the market. Now, it's not clear why people do better than the market. Maybe the people we see do better are random. And we're just not seeing the people that do worse than the market, and it all evens out in the end. But uh, it does seem that some people seem to find the strong form incredible because some people seem to beat the market. The semi-strong form implies that share prices adjust to new information uh, very rapidly uh, so that no excess returns can be used by trading on that information. But it at least gives a little bit more room uh, for the possibility that there might be some lag some uh, arbitrage opportunities in those uh, markets. And the semi-strong form contemplates that private information is not incorporated in the public price. And so if the private information is not incorporated, well, potentially having access to that information could give you some leverage. The weak form efficiency says, well, I don't really care if the price incorporates all the information because future prices cannot be predicted from past prices. And so we can't use the price to predict the future price. Uh, the weak form basically says, regardless of the information contained, it doesn't project onto the future. It's purely historical information that does not tell you the future of the stock. Just also to touch on, just to remind us uh, uh, some of the other matters that we covered. We talked about collateralized debt obligations. What are they? They're a structured financial product, effectively taking uh, a, a large box or, or container of, of various assets and cutting them up into tranches of risk. So it's not necessarily synthetic. Like you could have like 50 mortgages and instead of having five of those mortgages, you could have the first payout on all of them. Effectively a less risky investment. I mean, think about it. If you have five out of 50 mortgages, maybe your risk is the same as anyone else who has five out of those 50 mortgages. But if you get paid first, and the other, uh, the other nine people in the bundle get paid later, you have less risk than them. Right? And so you could create a priority. You could take 50 mortgages and say, Professor Orange gets paid first, 
Kristen gets paid second. Kristen just took a higher risk position than I did. She should expect some kind of risk premium. So a collateralized debt obligation is simply that. It's going to structure the assets in a way that we can tranche out the debt and have senior and junior uh, holders and lower and higher risk profiles with different expected returns. Synthetic obligations got a little trickier. In fact, I don't even have maybe the, the facility to describe them. But what I just described, a, a CDO is not that complicated. What really brought down, I think, the financial markets were these incredibly complicated synthetic uh, CDOs that instead of taking things like mortgages, took non-cash assets or even almost totally like invented things, packaged into invented things, packaged into indexes that tracked other indexes of indexes, and basically were, were drawn together by a very complicated math. They still are tranched investments, but the difference is a synthetic CDO is based not on a direct, a, a much more um, generalized linkage or no linkage to real assets and real property. Whereas a CDO itself is maybe not that sinister. And in, without a CDO, uh, maybe there are some small towns that would never be able to make home loans because it would just be too risky for the one bank in that town to make those loans. Maybe that is going to help tranche that and sell that off. Whereas the synthetic CDO uh, has a, n a number of additional features that require MIT physics PhDs to explain more thoroughly. So that's the class. That was the semester. And uh, we mostly focused on the shareholder litigation aspect of things this semester and those fiduciary duties, as that is one of the most heavily bar-tested subjects. We did, of course, talk about 10b-5, another topic that Pennsylvania likes to test on, and uh, the 1933 Act and some, some stock issuances. So that's the, um, that's the course. And I'll just close by saying I really enjoyed teaching all of you this year. I mean, I had a, I had a really, uh, really great year with you all. And I, I will always uh, look back fondly. It was a bit of a crazy year, actually. I mean, at the beginning, we had the horrible tragedy at Tree of Life. And uh, we had a lot of, uh, a lot of events and, and shuffling. And I'm sure that impacted you as it impacted me. I really appreciate it. I got a lot of really wonderful words of support. And I just want to thank you all for that. It meant a lot to me. It always will. Uh, and then we moved into a semester where there was legislative days and snow days and this, that, the other thing. And I tried to get inventive with the online modules, knowing that rescheduling business cl uh, night classes for evening students is really hard. Uh, so that kind of pushed me a little bit. Um, I hope that it was effective. Uh, I, I got some good feedback on that, too. But I, I really enjoyed that challenge. Um, and I hope that it made learning a little bit easier and more, more feasible. And, you know, I think having done this, looking back on what we learned, uh, it maps pretty well to everything the bar has covered in the last uh, 20 exams. So, I, yeah, I hope I've done you a service as well as had a little bit of fun along the way. And I just want to say thanks again for allowing me to be your professor for the year. So thank you. Any questions?